Willa Carroll, score for the body as close encounter. Fear your makeshift raft over six troubled rivers, seven dead seas, to bring me the last cask of honey from a promiscuous wilderness. All day we petition for rain, waiting out wildfires. All night we spill the milk of human time, cupping our hands to drink, compromised waters, fastening storms to boarded shores, capsizing our bodies, flesh, boats, mobile homes. Pledge allegiance to 16 sirens, rend my envelope, pluck my red, hot root, our blood flooded with legacy chemicals. Why stake your dime on us fools, top mammals, toxic sovereigns, scorched chorus. Our mighty synapses, our fast hands, we pass like nectar between the tongues of bees. led by my obsessions, my curiosities, um, my unanswerable questions about being human, alive on this planet at this time. Uh, often an emotional urgency spurs me to the page. Sometimes a, a phrase or a line will come to me through sort of like tuning into an internal radio station. Or sometimes a title comes to me first and then I sort of gestate the body of the poem over time. Reading poetry is essential to my writing practice. You know, it's like people come from people, poems come from poems. So if I'm moved by a poem, I'll often write a response poem or I'll riff on it in some way. Uh, my work also draws from reading fiction, nonfiction, journalism. Uh, I've written poems in response to visual art, dance, theater, music. You know, or sometimes it's just a fragment from a conversation or something I overhear on the street that sparks a poem. This poem deals with environmental degradation, um, climate change, extreme weather events, uh, species extinction, and various toxic exposures. I had in mind specifically the the bushfires in early in Australia in early 2020, uh, and then the, the fires in the American West, the wildfires in the American West later that year. I was also thinking of uh, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Michael in 2018 in the U.S., and Hurricane Sandy that hit us here in New York City in 2012. But at its emotional core, the poem is a sort of plea for more intimacy and connection and um, sort of a fragmented and increasingly uh, imperiled time. So this poem is part of a series dealing with various kinds of toxic exposures. Uh, I began this specific series not long after my first book was published, and I wasn't in the headspace to sit down and write a poem from beginning to end you know, as I had approached my poems more in my first book. So with this poem and this series, I began collaging fragments and phrases from failed or abandoned poems, you know, drawing, you know, my favorite little bits and pieces from poems that hadn't really, um, hadn't really come into full being. And so, and then I cast them as a scores for the body, uh, this poem and all the poems poems in a series are scores for the body, and, and I wanted to write something that could sort of cross the divide into another medium. Um, I come from a performance background in um, dance and theater, and um, so I wanted a text that could act as a score for a dancer, say, in performance. Um, in modern dance, the idea of the score, the term the score, you know, it's a set of, kind of verbal instructions for a, a structured improvisation. So I was thinking of casting the poem in that way. I think I was trying to get away from, I was a little burned out on poetry at that moment, and I wanted to write something that almost could be in, in another um, form, like I said, another medium. Uh, I was inspired also by Yoko Ono's 
instruction poems uh, and instructional art pieces. So I used, ended up using 12 of the poems from this series in a video titled uh, Project Hasmatic or for the Body Cautionary Tale that was published in Triquarterly. But this poem in particular, this close encounter poem, it was written during the COVID-19 lockdown in New York City in 2020. And I was longing for more human connection at that time. I think me, you know, any of us were. And just another thing I want to note about this poem is uh, it's in paragraph form. So it's essentially a prose poem, and it uses the vertical or the upright slash or the pipe symbol as its only punctuation. Um, there's many prose poems that use, that use slash yet I hadn't found any that use the upright slash, and I wanted to kind of innovate, find a new way to notate um, my phone on the page. So we see this upright slash in design, advertising, websites, emails, it's used in computing and mathematics. Um, it's, uh, I read that it's used in Sanskrit and Hindi as a, as a period, and also in medieval European manuscripts, it's used as, it was used as an alternative to the common period. So this glyph, the kind of archaic and modern glyph, is integral to the poem as a sort of inventive form. I think the poem is an inventive form. But it's, it's a prose poem, and it's not, sort of a fractured on it, and you know, fragmented and collage. Um, and then that symbol that I'm talking about, um, it allows me to play with touring the poem in terms of rhythm and pacing, and that's something I'm very interested in, in writing in general, is that the musicality of language, um, the sonics of a poem, the, the sense of rhythm and pacing. Um, I think that connects a bit to coming from a dance background. Um, and this last, the last thing I'll say is that the, the, the slash, the upright slash, kind of became this apt typographical notation for the text generated in a time spent mostly indoors. As I was writing the poem and the poems in the series, the 20 poems in the series, uh, the slashes started to look to be like little walls, you know, just holding the phrases and holding the poem together. Follow the heat. Follow the heat. Um, some of what we write in a, a wild, messy, free-ranging first draft, you know, will end up becoming like the warm, beating heart of a real poem um, or a finished poem. Yet so much in a first draft or even like a tenth draft can be just cold and bloodless and lifeless. So sometimes you really need to be ruthless and perform kind of radical revision surgery, wiping out the discursive, the prosaic, the flat parts of the draft that lack urgency. Uh, other times you might need to follow one hot ember, you know, to its fire source. You have to, like, walk towards the blaze of your idea and write more material from the initial spark um, that speak to you in that first draft. You know, we all have to find out what is, is what's at stake on the page. Why does the poem need to exist? We all need to discover something we didn't already know. So we have to, you know, follow the heat, <laughs> so to speak. Follow the heat since it's like the living core of what your poem wants to be. It can create a space in which language acts as a sort of malleable material, a kind of revitalizing force. So um, poems have their roots in, you know, ancient song, ritual, myth, drama. Uh, so I would urge readers to abandon the notion of trying to understand a poem or summarize it to one discrete meaning, if this is more for, for those uh, who are new to reading poetry. Um, you know, any good poem, it has multiple layers. Any good poem will have multiple layers of meaning, sometimes even embedded within a single line. I feel that poems can be experienced more like music or visual art, um, rather than, you know, deduced or understood or, you know, summarized. So, you know, what does the poem make you feel or think about? What are the associations or images conjured? How is the poem behaving? What's happening on this page? How does it engage you? Um, what is your experience of it? So, I think ultimately I would just say to trust your own inquiry of the poem. Well, there's no shortage of the exemplary poems in the world, which is a wonderful thing. So. Uh, I'll just go with a recent poem that um, I read by a wonderful poet, uh, Albert Avenato, 
and um, this poem is titled Advice for Using Blood in a Poem. It was published by the Academy of American Poets in their Poem a Day series recently, a month or two ago. Uh, so the poem makes so much the unexpected moves, and that's something that I really love in poems. It's a sense of surprise and a sense of, sort of kinetic um, shifting. Um, in this poem, it shifts between the mundane and the surreal. Uh, I love that shift when something is sort of rooted in the, in the actual world that we can recognize and then takes, takes a jump into something that's very unknown and, and surreal. Um, and the poem also shifts between the tragic and comic, something with a um, sort of humor and something with like a deeper emotional uh, core. Um, and it, it begins with advice for reclaiming loaded language and poetry, which is a great place start a poem, you know, sort of a poem, a poet a poem giving advice on how to read poetry, um, or how to write poetry, rather. And then it, it, it shifts, it includes the need for Zinfei's witness to colonial history, and then it, it finally explores the tatterness of blood ties of, of family. And um, each time I read a piece, I'm just engaged between it, uh, I'm engaged by a tension between gravity and playfulness, and that's something that uh, I love in poetry. Is that uh, when poems can shift tones between the high and the low, and it's sort of tragic and comic. And um, uh, Albert Avenato is a poet who does that wonderfully, and uh, and in this poem, which I which I really suggest reading.